Okay, everybody. We are ready to start. Okay. Um, so, welcome everybody uh, to Centre of the Cells uh, Big Question Lecture, celebrating 30 years of London's Air Ambulance. Uh, my name's Charlotte. Uh, I work for Centre of the Cell. I've been co-organising this event along with the lovely Rhiannon from the London's Air Ambulance team. And we're really, really excited uh, for tonight's event. Um, so, I'm aware that lots of you uh, might not uh, have heard of Centre of the Cell before today. Um, so just to tell you a bit about us. Uh, Centre of the Cell is a science education centre based here at the Blizzard Institute, uh, which is a research institute uh, on the Whitechapel campus of Queen Mary University of London. And we have lots and lots of school children and families who visit us uh, to learn all about the human body and medical research. Um, so we're having our 10-year anniversary later this year in September, and we've had about uh, 185,000 participants in our activities to date. Uh, so lots and lots of people have visit us, visited over the last 10 years. Uh, we also run a youth program uh, for people who are interested in science careers, um, and uh, this event takes place today thanks to that event. And we do have some of our youth members here, which is brilliant. Um, so. As I said, we're really, really excited and honoured to have some of the London's Air Ambulance team with us today um, to help us answer the question, what does it take to save the capitals critically injured? But before we get on to our talk, uh, just a couple of bits of housekeeping that I need to do first. Uh, so if you hear a fire alarm, uh, we're going to exit through the two front green doors um, and we'd ask that you follow the direction of all of our staff who are in blue hoodies like mine, um, and they will direct you to the fire safety point. Uh, if anyone needs to leave at any time during the lecture, then again, please use the front doors rather than the back doors because you don't want anyone to get lost and not be able to find their way back. Um, and uh, if you need any assistance, we will have some staff stationed outside throughout the lecture as well. Um, in a moment, I'm going to be handing you over to uh, Louise Robertshaw uh, from London's Air Ambulance. Um, so she leads on marketing and communications uh, at London's Air Ambulance. Um, and she's going to be introducing uh, all of our speakers. Uh, we're going to have uh, all of our speakers one after the other, and then there will be some time for questions right at the end. Um, so all that's left for me to do is let's give a warm welcome to Louise. Hello. First of all, I want to say a huge thanks to the Centre of the Cell for inviting us here tonight for this lecture. Uh, this year, you might already know, London's Air Ambulance has been celebrating 30 years of saving lives in London. The charity was established by a group of really, really pioneering consultants who saw people on, dying on the streets of, of London and wanted to find a way to do more to help. Three decades later, it still takes compassion, courage, and a pioneering approach to save the capitals critically injured. These are still the values that run through our service today. We have three crew members here tonight who are going to tell you more about the work that we do. Our first speaker is John Power. John is our Chief Fire Officer. John is responsible for fire prevention and safety at our helipad on the Royal London Hospital. He has worked in av aviation since 1989. Surely not John. <laughs> and has got his foot in the door, having been a member of the Air Training Corps. He enjoys working in such a close-knit team that we find here at London's Air Ambulance, and his real joy is meeting ex-patients and their families, which is very rewarding. Thank you, John. Thanks for that, Louise. Good evening. I'm not nervous at all. <laughs> um, so, my name's John Power, as we already know. Um, I'm in the back row. Uh, I'm sure you can spot me. And it is a black and white picture, and it does look like it was in the 1940s, but I assure you it wasn't. Um, this was in about the early 80s. And as, as Louise said, I was in the Air Training Corps. Um, I grew up in North London, in Wood Green, um, and was a bit of an aviation geek, always staring at planes. And this is the nearest I could get to aircraft living in North London. Um, got my gliding wings, uh, went around the world with the Air Training Corps um, and did Duke and Award Scheme. And it really did help me in getting a foot in the door uh, in aviation um, later. 
Here I am in 1994, and this is after working with two helicopter companies and working at uh, Battersea Heliport. Um, and as you can see, I was an influencer. Um, I was the first person to have a onesie, um, a fire retardant onesie at that as well. So, yeah, that was back in 94 when I, when I just joined. And as you see, it's a slightly different helicopter than what we operate now. Um, and that air aircraft um, was our original aircraft. And here's my team. And as you can see from the picture, um, hair is optional. Um, so we have a five-man team. Uh, and we also have um, contractors in to help us out uh, when we're carrying out extended hours. Um, None of us really have a fire background. None of us wanted to be firefighters. And actually, the job we do is, you know, if you want to be a firefighter, you're not going to get very excited working at London's Air Ambulance because you're not going to see many fires, hopefully. Um, so we've all got various backgrounds, some from military, some from civil aviation, um, and working alongside aircraft. And this is where we are, uh, 300 feet up above the Royal London. Um, so the first question people ask is, why do you need fire crew? Well, it's going to take a long time for London Fire Brigade to get themselves and their equipment up to that helipad. Um, if any of you have been through the Royal London and tried the lifts, you know what I mean. Um, no, they will have priority, but still it will take time to get up there. So we have a fire team on our own self-contained fire, fire, firefighting system, um, which we can deal with a fire. We can use up to 9,000 litres of foam onto that helipad if, if we need to. And I'll go on about that uh, later in the talk. Um, a sort of day in the life, um, if it's winter, it's not a very great start to the day because you don't even get your cup of coffee. You go straight to snow clearing sometimes or clearing ice. Um, as you can see from this uh, picture, we've got a lovely view of the city as well. So we're weather forecasters for the pilots. So they'll ring usually about half seven in the morning and say, can you see the gherkin? Can you see Canary Wolf? Can you see the shard? And that's our attempt at being weather forecasters. Um, so we tell them what the weather is, uh, and then they make a decision whether it's a go, no go, to come into the air, into the helipad uh, eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, we check all our equipment, and we walk around the pad looking for loose articles. Um, you'd be surprised what you find up there. There are some peregrines that have been seen to fly over the years and leave their leftover food on the pad um, for us to collect in the morning. Um, but yeah, so we check all our equipment. Um, sort of methodically every single day. Uh, and then we're in position for the aircraft to land. Um, you can see one of my colleagues there, and we've got our fire, foam fire, firefighting system, the monitor, ready to go. Every time the aircraft is activated, it takes about four minutes to get airborne. Uh, and again, we're in position in our full PPE, our, our protected equipment, uh, ready for every uh, launch. We also check the aircraft to make sure it's secure all doors and panels are closed before it launches and before we give the pilots the thumbs up. When they come back from missions, we restock the aircraft, or help restock, so we, we, we listen to what's happened and then we can make an educated guess of what equipment they need, uh, plus also the, the doctors and the paramedics can just call us directly and say we need this piece of kit and what have you. Um, for innovation, we're carrying lots more equipment than what we used to. Um, it's fine and proof. They're in the red bag, the green bag, the blue bag. So we can't really get it wrong. One of our roles as well is patient handling. So we'll inform the A&E department when the patient's arriving uh, and we'll get the patient off and down to the emergency room. We also bring fresh equipment up at the same time so the aircraft can be restocked by the pilots while we're dealing with the patient. No patients were harmed in this picture. This is one of our team from HQ who had a lovely day um, with a plastic tube in his mouth uh, for this photo shoot. Sometimes, obviously, we don't need to restock, and we're just two smiling faces coming back, maybe a bit of sarcasm to the, to the medical team, um, but just to welcome them back home um, after a mission. And we average three or four missions a day in the aircraft and four or five missions at night in the car. We're also tour guides. Um, we get quite a few uh, visitors from corporates, charities of the year, and people who have done special fundraising efforts for us. Um, so we're usually guiding people around, looking after their safety, and, all, and informing them of what we do. Occasionally we get a cup of tea or coffee. Just occasionally. It can be a long day. As I say, we, we operate, the aircraft operates from 8 in the morning until sunset. Um, 
any time after that, then the team will go by car. Um, the reason being is we, we can't land anywhere after darkness because our, 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 our aviation team can't see power lines and phone lines and what have you. Um, so strictly after, after, after night, we, we, we go by car. Saying that, we can land somewhere just before night and stay as long as we want, as long as we get back to a lit helipad or an airport. So occasionally we'll be there into the small hours waiting for the team or the patient to get back to us. Training. Training is my favourite. Uh, every day, uh, me and my team, we go in thinking that today's the day. This is, it's, and this is the only attitude you can have. Today's the day when you need to use your skills. So we, we do love our training. Um, there's training and there's training. So we prefer the latter there. So uh, that's us fire training um, a few years back. Um, our medical teams like training as well. And, and again, more and more training now with more and more equipment. What we're using more new procedures. Um, but it's not just about the equipment. It's about communication skills, working with other team members, working with fire brigade, police, and dealing with relatives as well. Um, so it's quite an intense training session, very realistic, sometimes very scary. Um, we also now start to use some very lifelike mannequins, um, sort of Hollywood special effects type, which are very scary and unnerving even to the, to the medics. Uh, back to my fire training, our team's fire training. So we use, again, high fidelity training, as realistic as possible. We go away to a company in Norfolk every six months. Uh, where they have a helipad where they train the offshore uh, teams to deal with an offshore incident. Most of you see pictures of London Fire Brigade squirting water. They have been known to be called as water fairies, but um, we don't use as much water. Um, because we're dealing with mainly fuel fires, we tend to throw everything else at it as well as water. So we've got foams, we've got dry powders, and we've got CO2. And again, the idea is to get the fire out as quickly as possible. Um, and to prevent reignition, and there is only two of us, so you want, when you've got that fire out, you want to make sure it's out. Again, once the fire brigade get to us, we will hand over. They will be in command, and we will stand back and advise on, on the risks. And there's a little science bit about foam. Basically, it's water and bubbles, but there is a film in between which actually stops the fuel vapors from actually getting airborne. And if you put your foot into the foam and walk across it and then put your foot out, you can see the film actually seal up in front of you. Um, so again, not releasing any, any vapour that could ignite. And then we have CO2 for engine fires as well, so that's a real large CO2 cylinder. Uh, and again, it displaces all the oxygen um, and, and snuffs out the fire and a bit of cooling as well. And then we get to dealing with casualties. We have to make sure the deck is completely safe for us to go to the aircraft to deal with casualties. Hence why we've got the foam systems and what have you to make the deck safe first. We also attend um, International Fire Training Centre up at Teesside where we train in incident command and we get to play with some quite cool fire engines which won't fit on our pad. Um, this one has a tungsten spike which can actually enter inside an aircraft and then you can spray water inside to put out an internal fire. We also do with multi-aircraft incidents uh, and again, we want to deal with agencies and manage a scene. This is our system um, upstairs on the pad. Unfortunately, we don't use it that often on the pad because um, it takes about an hour to refill. That means the pad's closed for an hour. So we rarely actually use that system on the pad apart from testing. And there we are training um, on the pad as well. And now, fire training um, and, and working. Uh, the majority of the team on the helipad are, are, are passionate about London's Air Ambulance and we're always out raising money. I was silly enough to do a 10k in that kit, I won't do it again. Um, I was silly enough to hang off a building, I won't do that again either. Um, I didn't mind the fundraising um, out in the public, I enjoyed that. And some of my team members did the Marathon de Saab last year um, and I won't be doing that either. Um, again, at the end of the day, one of the, the best bits about this job is this young lady, um, uh, Jessica, um, her family were told that she would not recover, um, literally, and she, she was coming back to say thank you. And it is very nice if you've been on duty that day and your little bit of support for the aircraft has helped help that patient.
Thank you, John. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Flora Bird. Flora, Flora has worked for both London's Air Ambulance and also Essex and Hearts Air Ambulance. She has also gained experience with a number of search and rescue uh, teams in the UK and abroad, including in East Africa. She has completed research into children's responses to immersion and swimming in cold water. And away from work, Flora, Flora may be found running cold water swim running, sorry, I'm reading badly this evening. Flora can be found running cold water swimming, my goodness, or playing music. Thanks, Flora. Thank you, Louise, and thank you all very much for coming this evening. It's lovely to see such a diverse and large audience. So I thought I'd start by telling you a little bit about um, me and how I've got to doing what I love doing, which is working with London's Air Ambulance, alongside a few other things. So I currently hold four roles at the moment. I work in, as an emergency medicine consultant here at the Royal London. Um, I fly pre-hospitally, um, attending trauma and some medical patients. I work for QMUL University, um, uh, running part of the BSc in pre-hospital medicine. Uh, and I also work with London's Air Ambulance as a head injury research fellow, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. So I'm very lucky. I have a very diverse and very busy life. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it's worth probably saying to the budding medics amongst you that... Science wasn't always obvious to me. I didn't, it certainly didn't come particularly naturally. I was probably more of an artist than a scientist. Medicine I consider as a combination of the two. Um, and, but I worked hard to get my A-levels and I, I went on to Bristol University, which for me was a great choice um, with great diversity and great opportunities. And it was in my fifth year there as an elective student that I went to um, Kenya. And I spent some time with AMREF, which is the, essentially the flying doctors in East Africa. And I had a very informative time. This particular picture was taken um, on a mission we went to in, this is a caravan. It's called a caravan. It doesn't look like a caravan. It's called a caravan because it's an unpressurized aircraft. So you fly for quite a long time um, through down the Rift Valley um, in unpressurized aircraft, arrive feeling quite sick um, with a little bit of a headache. Uh, and we... <clears throat> landed on a dirt airstrip and we found two patients there. They ha were from Nairobi. They ha were selling Safaricom, the um, telephone communication system out in Kenya. And they'd been shot through the side of their Jeep. And there were two patients. One was, one had died before we got to him and the other was alive. And I was a medical student at the time and I did what I could to help and we loaded them both in the same aircraft um, and flew them back to Nairobi, where, they, um, where the patient who um, hadn't died was treated and the patient who had died was cared for in an appropriate way. And that journey and that experience and that experience out in Kenya for me was very informative and I came away from it essentially wanting to come back to the UK and to gain whatever experience and education I could in order to feel confident and competent to manage any clinical scenario with a patient, however sick they are, essentially with limited resources in the middle of nowhere and feel able to do that. And that kind of really began my journey to London's Air Ambulance because I knew the reputation preceded it. And I knew that the education and the training and the experience that you get is second to none. So, the subsequent 10 years or so were spent doing a number of different things. Again, incredibly lucky with the experiences that I've had to date. I spent some time hanging out on a wire out of seeking helicopters, abseiling down cliffs in Cornwall. It was beautiful uh, with the Royal Navy. Um, I spent some time, as you heard earlier, doing some research, working with children who wanted to break the world record to be the youngest to swim the channel. So myself and um, another medic um, helped them on that journey, which they did, which is great. Um, and off the back of that, I told them how um, important it might be to contribute to science as well. So come along and get in our cold flume in the University of Portsmouth. So we, they swallowed um, tablets, which were thermometers, size of vitamins, and they um, essentially were live radio feeds for their internal core temperature. So we, so we gained some really important and useful information from that scenario. Um, I worked with Essex and Hearts Air Ambulance, um, and still do, um, and I spent, have done a number of um, bits around expedition and wilderness medicine, and this is one of those, which is 
in Gallenvada expedition, which was um, a Anglo-Dutch um, kayakers, six of them in total, um, who did a non-stop kayak from Holland to England. And on the back of that, and with that experience and a number of other things along the way, I ended up at London's Air Ambulance, and how lucky I am to have been involved in that, because <clears throat> there is nothing quite like it. So you get to see London um, by day, from, this is from the aircraft, and we see London by night. This is us being dropped off and moving on to the cars. And really, to me, the most, in, well, one of the most key, key enjoyable parts of this is the team that we work with and how important that is. So I know that when I'm going to a job, I know that I have had the best possible setup from the crews back at the pad to having the best possible teammate and sidekick beside me, a paramedic who's at the top of their game. Um, and working, we now work more often than not in a three-person team with a consultant, um, a, a training registrar, and a paramedic. Um, and we go through experiences through day and through night together, and it's a really phenomenal thing to do, because what you're going through are intense experiences, and you are all doing your absolute best to make good of what is often a very sad and difficult scenario. But you, we go confident in the knowledge, having trained as hard as we do, that we hope that we will give that patient the best possible chance of survival or, um, and or survival with a limited injury pattern. Um, and so our patients, our patients are a huge variety from every walk of life of every age. Um, we go to trauma patients with London's Air Ambulance because there's enough work for us to do only going to trauma patients. Um, <clears throat> and what we do as how I describe it to some people is any, you can pretty much get to a major trauma centre within 10 minutes anywhere in London. So the patients that we go to have to be so sick that they can't wait 10 minutes to get to hospital and that what we are able to bring them by the side of the road will potentially impact on whether they survive and, and or with what injuries they survive. So we, are, we put people to sleep on the roadside, we give them anaesthetics. Uh, when necessary, we perform emergency life-saving surgery. Um, and we essentially go to what are the sickest patients in London. There, is, there has always been, and there is a continuous drive to be innovative within this charity. And that is, in a num that is demonstrated through a number of different ways. These are just a few examples. So. Um, we don't, we, this isn't a replacement for the helicopter. We don't lift ourselves by police. <laughs> um, we, we have something called a Reboa, um, which some of you may have heard of, but essentially, if, a patient, if we believe a patient is bleeding to death um, from an injury below the level of their diaphragm that we can't compress and stop that bleeding, um, one option within our sort of armory is to place a balloon inside their aorta so up through their vasculature from their groin into their aorta to inflate it and then therefore to stop blood supply to anywhere below the level of that balloon so that they don't lose any further blood from there. So we continue to circulate blood around their heart, their lungs and their brains and then in time hope that we can get them to theatre quickly to fix whatever the bleeding problem is below the level of the balloon. We've recently introduced a new blood product, which is red cell and plasma, um, which essentially is trying to get closer to a whole blood product. Um, but to the non-medics amongst you, um, for patients who are bleeding to death, what we want to do is to give them blood back as close to what they have lost, um, as opposed to just salty water, which was previously what was um, years ago, what was the only option. Um, coming soon is something called ECMO, which is essentially putting a patient on bypass in the community on the roadside. So um, there is ongoing innovation all the time here because we are always striving to do better. Um, the days are long. They can be very tiring. They're meant to be 12 hours. They often aren't. And sometimes we feel tired. <laughs> this is us feeling tired. <laughs> um, and all of this experience, I suppose, brought me back last year to a bit of a sort of close a cycle. Um, so in December 2018, so six months ago, I went back to AMREF 
um, armed with the experience and the education that I'd had through the processes that I'd been through. Um, and I worked as a doctor again for AMREF, and it was a, it was a wonderful thing for me to be able to do. Um, and I had that patient who I'd gone out there to see, which is a, a very sick patient who I hoped I could help. Um, and it was a young girl, 23-year-old girl, who was a pedestrian versus bus. Um, she had a significant head injury. We got to her 24 hours later. We landed on a dirt airstrip. The sun was going down. I was working with people I'd never worked with before, um, who didn't, I didn't speak their language. Um, and we were, I was, we were able to give her an anesthetic to care for her, to look after her pelvis, to look after her long bones, to fly her to hospital. Um, and this is largely thanks to the experience I've had through the last 12 years or so, but particularly the education I've had through London's Air Ambulance, I was able to do that. So that was a nice closing of their loop for me. Um, so whilst we are a, a world-leading um, pre-hospital system, um, there we, we all appreciate that we still have an awful lot to learn. Um, we are getting patients um, who previously would have died on the roadside. They're now, we are now getting them to hospital. Um, they are not all surviving, and we are absolutely striving to try and get to the bottom of why our patients are dying, if they're dying, um, of what is, why are we successful when we are successful. Um, head injuries is something I'm particularly interested in and as a head injury fellow. It's something I'm looking at, but there are a huge number of patients who end up with head injuries and a number of patients who don't survive head injuries. Um, and, we don't, and we haven't seen an improvement in... Um, outcome in head injuries like we have in other traumatic injuries for the last 30 years. There is a lot to do and there's a lot left to do um, and this organisation certainly does its best to try and further that knowledge and take it to the wider audience and to the world um, and hope that we in the future will have survivors um, in patients who currently, where currently we don't however hard we try. So I'm going to um, leave you with that and pass on to the next person before questions afterwards. Thank you, Flora. That was really interesting. Um, our final speaker tonight is Alex Ulrich. Alex joined London Ambulance Service in 2007 and progressed through a variety of roles. She became an advanced uh, paramedic practitioner in 2015 um, specialising in critical care. Um, in her spare time, Alex enjoys travel and playing rugby for cuffly ladies, playing in the front row as a loose head prop. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure Alex can tell us more. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks, Louise, and thanks to John and Flora uh, for some hard acts to follow. Um, <laughs> So, um, as we said, my name's Alex, and I'm one of the HEMS paramedics um, for London's Air Ambulance. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about how I ended up working for London's Air Ambulance um, and to sort of share my story. So, if there's any of you thinking about becoming a paramedic in the future or a paramedic for London's Air Ambulance, then perhaps um, this might help. So, I started my early years um, just doing things I loved. So, on the left is pictures of me in a basketball team and on the right doing some mountaineering and I'm sorry about the grainy photos not quite black and white though. <laughs> um, early early smartphone pictures um, and I guess that's what uh, really led me to be in the paramedic because I did things that I loved and it gave me a really diverse background so the map reading the sport but also I worked in a care home which I absolutely loved and um, I volunteered for St. John Ambulance as well. So I guess I had a sort of well-rounded background to start off with. And that led me to university in 2007, where I studied paramedic science. And at the time, there were various different ways of becoming a paramedic. Um, but I chose this route um, mainly because it offered the university lifestyle alongside learning how to become a paramedic. Um, so, I guess in terms of choosing a university, the biggest things for me were what else the university could offer. Um, so whilst at the moment to become a paramedic or to do a paramedic science degree at one of the many universities across the country, uh, you need um, an A-level in a natural science subject and some UCAS points between 104 and 
168, I think. The biggest selling point for me for the university was what they could offer me in my spare time. Um, so again, I spent a lot of time playing basketball there and really enjoyed it. And then in 2010, I graduated as a paramedic and started work for London Ambulance Service, where I've worked throughout my career. And I spent five years being a paramedic on an ambulance and working on a car, and also doing events such as the Pride event on the left. Um, and in that time, I built up a lot of experience in terms of working on an ambulance. Um, I worked on a fast response car. Um, and just saw a real wide variety of different patients. So people with very minor injuries, but also people with um, real critical care emergencies. And I developed a real interest for critical care. And in 2015, became an advanced paramedic specializing in critical care. And that essentially meant that I would be sent on a car by myself to assist ambulance crews dealing with patients with critical care emergencies, such as cardiac arrest and um, life-threatening conditions and that gave me a great exposure to patients who were essentially dying of medical problems but it meant that I wasn't seeing many patients who were dying of trauma emergencies and so that was an, always an area I wanted to explore some more so at the end of last year I was successful in an application to fly with London's air ambulance and in February this year, I passed my sign-off, which is the slightly teary-eyed uh, photo on the left, <laughs> after a month of a lot of hard work, and have now been flying for Lander's Air Ambulance for nearly six months. And I can honestly say it's the best job I've ever done. Um, in terms of the day-to-day -day job, um, the paramedics' responsibilities are varied. But as um, Flora and John said, the aircraft doesn't fly at night. So that means that we have to travel after sunset by car. And as a paramedic, and with our blue light experience that we already have from the ambulance service, we drive these absolutely fabulous cars under the instruction of Paul Smith, who's our driving standards uh, manager. And we get a three-day, four-day course in um, a, an advanced driving update, but also he teaches us how to drive um, in convoy and escort, which is something we don't normally do in the ambulance service. Um, and it is a real pleasure driving these lovely fast cars. Um, and we also work in the control room. So in order to be able to dispatch the aircraft, we have to find the right patient to send them to. So as Flora said, we attend patients with suffering major trauma. So we sit in the control room, listening in to 999 calls that are incoming and hearing what's happening at the scene so that we can decide whether a, an air ambulance is needed. Um, so as you can see there, the picture on the left, my colleague Jason sifting through 999 calls, looking for the right patient. And then when we dispatch the aircraft, the aircraft has um, three minutes to lift. Um, so as you can see, uh, Neil run into the aircraft there, but essentially at the moment the klaxon goes off, we run into the aircraft, speaking to air traffic control and preparing ourselves to lift to get to that patient as quickly as we possibly can. Um, and also we um, assist with um, loading patients, packaging them, um, offloading them if we fly them back to the hospital, and assisting with the interventions that might happen on scene. Um, so in terms of those interventions, um, as a paramedic, we do our standard paramedic care, so splinting, giving analgesia, uh, getting intravenous access, so putting in drips, um, but on London's Air Ambulance, we've just got a few extra skills. So um, if we needed to, we could intubate the patient, which is the top right picture. And that's essentially um, putting a tube down into the patient's windpipe so that we can breathe for them. And also um, something called a thoracostomy, where if a patient's lung has collapsed and um, the pressure in their chest was building up, we could cut a small hole in their chest um, just under the armpit just to relieve some air. So we have a few extra skills over and above what a, a normal paramedic um, would do. Um, so essentially, um, the words of advice, if anyone was ever thinking about a career as a paramedic or on London's Air Ambulance, the best thing about this job is that you work in a team with people who are really inspiring and challenge you every day. So do what you love, work with amazing people but also have fun as well. And um, playing rugby is always, is always good fun for me.
it keeps me grounded and uh, makes me realise that, um, that it gives you a balanced life. <laughs> um, I think we're going to do questions at the end. But thank you for listening. Uh, thank you so much uh, to John, Flora and Alex for some wonderful talks. Um, we have a bit of time for questions now. Uh, so um, we, if I can get Sophia, Sophia is going to bring round a handheld mic for questions so that we can all hear your questions. Um, so please do just wait for Sophia to get there. Um, I'm going to try and get people from across the room. So if there's lots of questions, I'm sorry that if I don't get to you. Um, but there will be some time after... Uh, we're finished with the official Q&A where we can have some refreshments outside uh, and you can come and chat to these guys afterwards as well. Um, as we are a bit short on time, um, if I could just ask you to keep your questions as brief as possible, that would be great. Um, so is there anyone who would like to ask one of our speakers a question? Quite a few people. Um, so Sophia, can I send you over here first and then up to the back after? Brilliant. Um, for Alex, um, do you need to be an advanced paramedic to join Hempstead? Sorry, no, no, you don't. Uh, so the question was, do you need to be an advanced paramedic to be in the Hems team? No, you definitely don't. Um, it's just that that was my sort of route of interest, if, if you like, in critical care. But if you um, if you're a paramedic in the London Ambulance Service, with uh, I think it's two years' experience, then you're eligible to apply for the role of Hems paramedic. Okay. Yeah, there's a question right at the back. <laughs> we'll give Sophia a second to get up there. Good evening. I think it's really important to give the staff an opportunity to do some exercise. <laughs> uh, John, Flora, Alex, it was fascinating. Uh, I've got a question which John sort of inspired, but anybody could answer it. If there's one thing that you wish, wish they would have told me that before I got into this. What would be that one thing? I'll just put my two penny worth in. Um, I think the job takes over your life. Um, you, yeah, it's, it's always there. There's no such thing as a day off because you're communicating with friends and colleagues. Um, yeah, I mean, it does take over your life, but in a nice way. Um, and... So the doctors usually do about six months and the paramedics do nine months to a year. So every six months you've got a new set of friends. So. It's a very good and a very difficult question. <clears throat> My answer would be um, how, difficult, how difficult it is to go to something else afterwards and how much you miss it. Um, there are, there are um, it, it, is a, it is a phenomenal job. Most people come away feeling like it's the best job that they've ever done. Um, I don't think that any of us feel we should, all, we should do it full time, all the time and forever for a number of reasons. But um, it is definitely that, that adjustment period afterwards is certainly challenging. Yeah, I'll definitely echo what Flora says. I'm six months in, with six months to go, I'm already feeling the, uh, the sadness about that. At some point, this is going to end. But I guess the, something else would be. There's always so much cake and biscuits at the end. There's so many just mentioned to me. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, we've got some more questions. We've got one here um, and then one here. So we'll start there. Thank you. Hello. Um, I was just wondering what are the main medical factors which would be the difference between trauma and trauma that requires uh, the airman's attention? And also what sort of events would actually you know, is, is it mostly very traffic collisions and that sort of thing? You, you, you tend to um, a bit more context around that, please. Thank you. Yeah. So in terms of dispatch, um, we're looking for the most major, major trauma, which I know sounds a bit woolly, um, but there's lots of things that would be classed as major trauma. For example, if you were to break your ankle and the bone was to pierce the skin and be an open fracture, 
that weed class has major trauma, but you wouldn't necessarily need a HEMS team for that. It would depend on how it happened and various other things, but it's major trauma, but we're looking for the most major trauma. So, for example, um, someone who's been stabbed and is bleeding to death, someone who's hit the head and is unconscious, um, someone who's been run over or gone under a train, for example. Um, so we're looking for that real high-end stuff and as John said it's about three or four patients a day uh, sorry in any 12 hour period um, and we get five to six thousand nine 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 calls a day so trying to sort of real find that needle in a haystack um, that's yeah I'd say the major major trauma <laughs> Yeah. It's worth sort of reiterating how what an incredible job it is that the paramedics do in, in the EOC because without appropriate dispatch the, the service makes no sense. Um, so the, the concept is that we are able to bring something to a patient that can't wait the 10-15 minutes to get to hospital um, and that what we bring will potentially impact on their experience of that difficult traumatic injury whether they live or die and if they do live with what injuries that they survive um, there's a question yeah in the middle there and then we'll go to the back uh, with regards to lessons learned uh, what are your biggest non-clinical experiences that you've taken back to your clinical practice outside of pre-hospital care <coughs> There's, there's a lot actually and the truth is is that I think this job is much more about non-clinical than clinical. Um, we feel that we can teach any clinician to do a lot of the tasks and um, practical procedures that we do. Um, the really challenging part and I think the most rewarding is around the much softer stuff which is about human factors and communication. Um, so that is certainly one part of it, working within a team, um, not just our team, but also the team that we meet on scene, the paramedics, the fire crew, whoever we see, on, we, we found we, the police, whoever we find on scene, um, and trying to make the best of a really quite challenging situation, how we best communicate, how we make an A, how we deliver an A-star performance um, in really difficult scenarios. So the human factors communication bit to me is key. The other thing I think that um, is done better in this service and in pre-hospital services that I've worked in than anywhere else in the NHS and I try desperately hard to try and bring back to the NHS is about debriefs and about talking. Um, we see an awful lot doing this job um, as in we see an awful lot um, and yet touch wood hopefully we do well to keep well um, in our minds um, and that is absolutely critical and I think partly the reason for that is because we talk and we talk as we go and we debrief and we have open, just plain culture whereby we sit in a room twice a week and as often in the pub as we need to. Um, and we talk through cases in quite a matter-of-fact way. Um, and in doing so, <clears throat> it allows you not just to offload and process what you've seen and done, but also allows for us all, we all feel comfortable and safe in an environment to say, what would someone else have done next time? Because every single job we go to, no one else has been to before. So th there is something pretty much, you know, there is, a, there is no scenario that's completely identical, largely because of environmental factors. Um, but it, it ha we have somehow managed, and it's thanks to the people who have preceded all of us, to create a culture by which we feel able and comfortable to talk and therefore to improve um, and to reflect. So that's what I try and take back to my NHS colleagues. Is anyone else? Mm -hmm. Okay, there's one at the back and then we'll come down over here. Yeah. Hi, how are you? Uh, I'm Fahad, I'm advanced paramedic. Uh, I would like to ask you about the, the flight paramedic uh, certificate course, if you have, and about the critical care uh, certificate. Uh, do you have this course in your company or not? Thank you. Thank you. Um, in terms of the flight paramedic qualification, it's... Um, we have something called the uh, pre-hospital care course, which um, gives us a sort of insight into um, how to safely anaesthetise people, how to safely move people and operate as a team. Um, but the sign-off period is really the month in which you learn the most, but that's only open to people that are then going to work on the air ambulance. 
Um, so it's not really something that could be offered out um, in itself because it's bespoke to the job that you're going into. Um, and in terms of the critical care qualification, is that in terms of being a paramedic? Um, so in London Ambulance Service, we offer roles for paramedics um, going into advanced paramedic practitioner roles, and they're advertised on NHS jo jobs. And the qualification for that is, again, preceding the job. Um, so both are basically on the back of a job application as opposed to a course that's open to everyone. Um, unless you guys can think of anything else. We've just got a couple of questions at the front here and then we'll see how we're doing for time. Um, when Princess Diana died in that tunnel in Paris all those years ago, I seem to remember there was a disagreement between England and France on how the trauma people worked, whether they should have done something, would have taken, should have taken it to the hospital or would have done something in that car. So my question really is, I mean, there were lovely talks, so I really, really like this. Um, it, how international is it now? Are you working with French trauma people, German, and the EU, and all that, and does that strengthen the whole thing both ways? So I, I can't comment on the, I don't know enough about the Princess Diana scenario to comment directly about that, but what I do know is that um, essentially <clears throat> pre-hospital medicine, so within the UK, first of all, pre-hospital medicine has only very recently been described and um, recognised as a sub or as a specialty in itself, as a medical specialty in itself in the last couple of years, um, which is in itself a, um, a huge accolade to all of these people who have been doing pre-hospital medicine for a very long time. Um, so it's now a recognised specialty, which is good. Um, the, and therefore there are exams and there are fellowship exams for, this is for doctors, for clinicians in this role. Um, we have air ambulances that are doctor paramedic um, led across the UK. Um, there are some that are also paramedic, paramedic led as a two person team. And then as you go abroad, you have, there are diff um, they have doctor paramedic teams in some countries, like France, they have their, their own system there. Um, Israel has a different system as well. Um, and then you get across places like America where they don't tend to take their doctors pre-hospitally. They tend to be paramedic-led pre-hospitally as far as I'm aware. And in Canada, you have doctors and paramedics working together or flight nurses, same in Africa, same in... Um, in the country is going to, uh, in Australia, um, but those are, are often covering much longer distances, therefore very often being retrieval services as opposed to primary medical or traumatic services, which is what we do. Um, do we share, so it is very varied across the world is what I would say. Are we, do we share our learning and our systems? We try to. Um, there are conferences that occur. I remember a very informative discussion um, at the London Trauma Conference a couple of years ago now, <clears throat> which had a panel representative from four different countries, and they were talking about major instances and significant events, and it was very clear to see that each crew and country would have managed it quite differently, actually, and it's not to say that one is better than the other. It's very much to do with the infrastructure that's available to them in their country and the resources that they have. Um, we're a pretty unique system here, I would say, whereby we get to... Um, a vast number of patients who are very, very sick in a short time frame. Um, and as such, I think that we have a responsibility to share our learnings about the physiology of illness because we see it much earlier than most people can do or do do. Um, so that's probably about research and information sharing. But as far as systems go, it's very dependent on what is available But we, in, within each country and within each city and town. Um, and what the demand is, I suppose, um, on them. But we, there are certainly, having been watching this platform for the last 10, 12 years, those conversations are increasingly happening because we all, we all, you know, predict and prepare for and dread a moment where we need vast numbers of resources in a really challenging scenario, like a major incident, like a terrorist event that we've seen over the last couple of years. Um, and so we very much sit and listen to our colleagues in France and Paris and in other places in Israel who have gone through um, other different but challenging scenarios and we all take on board what we might be able to learn. Okay, we've got a question here. Yeah. Um, thanks very much guys for the presentation, it's fantastic and thank you for your service to London, appreciate that. Um, 
Apart from losing patients, what is the worst part of your job? The coffee's not always that good. Um, I think, uh, as Flora said in her talk, um, I think at the end of the day, some days you can be exhausted. Uh, that's probably the worst bit. Um, worked very hard uh, as a team um, when you had a really busy day. And I think that's probably the hardest bit. Um, there's definitely more pluses than minuses to the, to, to the actual role. I had two little gripes. Um, the database, which is documentation, but that's the same all over. <laughs> um, and the other thing is, and it's wholly necessary that we do very good documentation. Um, the other thing is, um, oh, I've forgotten it now. See, we love our jobs so much, we can't think of something to say. It'll come back to me if you've got anything. Just finishing late is sometimes completely unavoidable, um, but it occasionally it's difficult to get the other half to understand that there's absolutely no way I could have phoned or told him that I was going to be late. That's probably it. The other thing I was going to say was checking. We do a lot of checking, a lot of checking. Um, but that in itself is also something that's that I take, certainly take back to my other jobs and to realise how important it is. You get to, you become quite paranoid during this job. You don't really trust anything unless you've checked it, um, because because the um, the there is so little marginal gains are absolutely critical in this. We're working with very very tight parameters, often actually between life and death, um, in trying to resuscitate and um, and save somebody. And in doing so, every genuinely every little tiny bit counts, um, and that's everything from the time it takes for us to get to the patient, to the order in which we do things when we're on scene, to the communication that we have with our colleagues on scene in order to make a team work most efficiently and slickly. Um, and part of that is therefore checking that everything you think you're doing is happening. Um, and as a result, I don't just end up checking everything on scene, but also we need to know that what we have with us is exactly what we think we have with us. So we check our kit a lot. It's less than it used to be. We're more efficient about it now, which is good. Um, uh, but it does, so it's a kind of, it's a bittersweet thing because I know that it needs to happen, <laughs> but I don't always enjoy doing it. Okay, time, oh, sorry. Um, I was going to just... That one over here because we've not had many from this side of the room and that uh, might have to be the last one sorry thank you it's just a question about aftercare once you've taken the patient to the major trauma center do you ever follow up on their how they're doing and how, how their recovery is going absolutely it's very important um to uh, both as i said on the end of my talk to actually meet the patients is really valuable uh, especially if you actually realise you were working that day and they look a lot different by the time you've met them again than they did on that day. So it's very important for, for the team mentally as well. Um, we've got our own patient development nurse, um, Frank, and he will go down and meet patients and their families uh, and give them advice a day or two after the incident. Um, and then we kind of keep in contact with the patients as much as possible. And again, help them, inform them about other charities like Headway, Brain Injury Trust um, and any other charities. We did have one gentleman who was feeling rather down about losing a leg uh, and Frank managed to connect him up with another gentleman who had exactly the same injury uh, who said it's the best thing that ever happened to him. You can water ski now, you couldn't before. So, you know, you, you, it's, we're, we're trying to help people self-help um, by linking people up with similar injuries. Um, but as I say, that is a funded post, that's through charity that um, um, a, a company has given us the money to to finance for, for Frank's post. Um, but it's a very, very valuable post for everyone. Right. Can yeah. I finish with a quick story? Um, yeah. <clears throat> it's, I totally echo what John says, as I'm sure Alex feel the same, meeting patients afterwards. Knowing what happened to patients is so important um, because we, 
we do our best to try and work out what is happening to a patient, why they're as sick as they are, and to treat it, treat the injuries accordingly. So it's always really helpful for us from a, from a reflective point of view to know actually what the CT showed, what was wrong with them when they got to hospital, how they did. Um, but meeting patients is completely invaluable, I would say. Um, we see a, lot, a fair amount of sadness in this job, um, and occasionally you get a really... We have wonderful survivors and occasionally you get a really wonderful surprise. I remember going to a um, neurotrauma conference last year um, and prior to this I had um, seen a patient who was actually a medical student. Um, he was a pedestrian versus car. There were five people injured in the event, in the accident. And he was very, very sick. Um, he had a significant brain injury. Um, he was completely unresponsive and unconscious. Um, we put him to sleep on the roadside, we gave him a number of medications, we took him to hospital. I didn't think that he would probably survive. And, and 18 months later, I was at this neurotrauma conference, and the last speaker of the day was him. And he stood up and he gave a talk, and he is back at medical school, having taken a year out to get like the highest the highest score in a legal exam if in a year, um, and then gone back to medical school. And the reason that, not just because it's a wonderful story, but the reason it matters is because when we're seeing sadness um, and when we're all doing our best to improve things, cases like that remind us that it's absolutely 100% worth it. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay. Um, so... Uh, that's all the questions we have time for for now, but as I said, you're really welcome to come and chat to these guys outside. Uh, we'll have some refreshments outside in a moment, um, and they're very happy to chat to you a bit longer, uh, so please feel free to come and talk to them. Uh, there's just a couple of notes from me before we finish. Um, so first of all, uh, if you are new to Centre of the Cell and you want to keep in touch with us, you want to know more about our future events and what we do, uh, there will be next to the food, there'll be somewhere to sign up to our mailing list, so please do that if you're interested. Uh, if there are any uh, young people here today um, who are not youth members, but would like to be youth members, we've also got some youth member forms outside. So please feel free to grab them. You can fill them out now and give them back to us, or you can take them home. Uh, that goes for everybody uh, who isn't still a young person but might know one. Uh, you're very welcome to take some forms as well. Please just come and ask us if you have any questions about any of that stuff. Um, and I forgot to say at the beginning, if you'd like to share uh, any of your thoughts from this evening on social media, we do have hashtag uh, BigQuestion19, please tag uh, L London's Air Ambulance and also Centre of the Cell. Um, but all that's left, I think, before we go and get some snacks and some drinks, is to say a massive thank you to our speakers, John, Flora and Alex. <laughs> I'd also like to say a quick thank you to Louise and to Rhiannon for helping us put this event together. We couldn't have done it without you as well. So thank you. Okay, let's go and get some snacks. <laughs>